Turn today to Romans chapter 6. We'll finish this chapter today. And we're looking in verses 9, 6, chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. Chapter 6 has been good for me. I've learned a lot in it. And what I would like to bring today would be two programs. That would be the theme of the lesson today, two programs. There's a program of sin, and there's a program of righteousness that we will look at today. Those are the two programs. Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your, in, your members' servants to uncleanness and to, iniqu and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray as we look at these passages of Scripture today and we learn about uh, the servant of sin, the program of sin, the program of righteousness. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that, uh, that, uh, that what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary, that we can have righteousness, Lord, that we know that we're saved, we have eternal life, that we're in Christ, and we're thankful for that today. And we pray that this will be a help to all of us as we study this lesson. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Two programs. The program of sin. The program of, of righteousness. And that's why all believers should be aware of that. And understand that. And unfortunately, not everybody understands about the program of sin. Uh, and the program of righteousness. Especially the program of righteousness after... A person saved, they don't understand who they are in Christ and what God's done for them as much as they should. And looking at this chapter 6 and verse 15, it says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Notice that question is asked there in Romans 6, 15. And you'll find in chapter 6, it starts with a question. Verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So it starts with a question in chapter 15. There's a, the first question is chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Second question there is in verse 15. So the first question, what's the issue with this question in chapter 6 and verse 1? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That first question deals with our position in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Now we're saved, and the question comes up to Paul, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You don't continue in sin, grace may abound. But so that is talking about our position in Christ our new identity, but in chapter 6 and verse 15, this question is talking about something else. And that's what the rest of the chapter you're dealing with, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So we understand as believers now, our identity is in Christ. We understand we're not under the law. Uh, we're under grace. And we know this, shall we continue in sin because we're not under the law? God forbid. So we're, we understand that part. And the second question, what's the issue with this question? Is dealing with our liberty that we have in Christ. It's dealing with your practice. You're saved now. You've been justified. You believe the gospel. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. And now you have liberty in Christ. You're not under the law. You're under grace. And your practice now, your conduct now, your responsibility now, and that's what Romans 6, 15 on is dealing with. It's your walk, it's your practice, it's your uh, 
your identity. It's based on who you are in Christ. Now you know your position and you, you want to live based on who you are in Christ. So I'm saying this to you. We'll look at these two programs today. The program of sin first. And Romans 6.6 6 talks about the, the sin. It says Romans 6.6. 6. It says knowing this. So we know some things. That, what do we know? That our old man is crucified with Christ that the body of sin uh, might be destroyed, then henceforth we should not serve sin. There's a lot of people who don't know that verse and don't understand that verse. But we do know that here today. We know that our old man's crucified with, with him. That when Christ died, we died when we believe the gospel. So by understanding that, it's got, it talks about that the, hence, uh, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Well, the question is, what is the body of sin? That's the natural man in which is resident our old sin nature. That's the body of sin. That's our old man. Our old sin nature is what it is. Romans 6, 17 says, we're talking about the program of sin, Romans 6, 17, but God forbid, God, but God be thanked that ye were the service of sin. We were, but we're not now because we believe the gospel. But the service of sin, you think about we were lost, we were hell, hell bound, and we were the service of sin. So what was our relationship to righteousness? Before we got saved, what was our relationship to righteousness? Look in chapter 6 of Romans verse 20. Romans 6 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So as a lost person, you were free from righteousness. That was what your relationship was. Uh, to right, righteousness. You were free from it. We were in bondage to sin. We were not willing to or able to perform righteousness. We were just dead. We were. We look like man. We know the essence of man. We're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And before we got saved, you'll notice a little connection here with uh, soul and body. We were stuck together. We were dead. Your spirit was dead. Your soul was stuck in your flesh. And... Uh, we were lost, and we were free from righteousness. We had, uh, we did not have the righteousness of, of, of God in us. We were free from it, and we couldn't. We were not willing or able to perform righteousness. So, looking at this in Romans six verses twenty through twenty-three, we read that uh, a few seconds ago, and look at these verses here. It looks to the ultimate end of the program of sin. Is what these verses look at. You look in chapter 6 and verse 20 through 23, what, the ultimate end of sin. Well, what is the end of sin? Uh, you think about what is, the end of, what is the end of sin? Well, Romans 6, 23 tells you. The end of sin is for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is the end of sin? And the answer is death. And you know the death, what it will be? It will be the lake of fire. It's going to be eternal damnation. And you can go to Revelation 21. We will not do that today. We have. But that's what death, sin ends up, is death. And this death is a reference to eternal death in the lake of fire. And you, you think about the eternal death. Go back to Matthew chapter 10 for just a minute. Matthew chapter 10. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 interesting verse Romans uh, I did not say Romans Matthew chapter 10 Matthew 10 28 verse 28 and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell now we know what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. The dead, the lost are going to be resurrected up out of hell. And they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment. And they're going to be judged uh, for their sins. Then they're going to be cast in the lake of fire. So keep, keep that in your mind here. And you think about the wrath of God. The wrath of God is poured, was poured, out, is poured out three times without mixture. It's still the lake of fire is yet to come. But you think about the wrath of God. The wrath of God was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. When He died on that cross, God's wrath was poured out on Him. 
He bare the sins of the world. He took that wrath for us that we could be saved and have everlasting life. Then the second wrath that will be poured out is in the tribulation period. God will pour out His wrath on the nation of Israel during that seven year period of time. Second coming there. So the wrath of God is poured out. Then the third time is when, at the great white throne judgment when the dead, the lost are, are, are cast out like a fire. The wrath of God will be poured out on them throughout eternity, forever. So those are the three times about the, the wrath of God. But when you look at Matthew 10, 28, it talks about uh, body and soul. And fear not them which kill the body. Well, that's your flesh. All of us know that. But are not able to kill the soul. So there's, there's two there. You can see uh, body and you can see soul there. Without, it, without any doubt there. Well, it takes spirit, soul, and body to make up the essence of man. And that's what we've got, spirit, soul, and body. And there's a teaching out there, even today, people teach that the, that the soul and body are the same. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. And that's the wrong teaching. They're not the same. And I'll give you the verse, one verse, there's others, but First Thessalonians, we all should know this here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 5, 23. They're not the same. Soul and, uh, and body is not the same. We know that we're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And by saying that, <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the three parts that we're made up of. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, by saying that, we're going to go back to the Old Testament for just a minute. Go back to Job chapter 12. This is time past. Job chapter 12 and verse 10. For Job 12, 9. <clears throat> in verse 9, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, and whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. So we're talking about the soul of every living thing. So we want, we want to look what Job says about the soul. Look at Job 14. Job chapter 14. And look at verse 22. This is a good verse to remember here. Job 14, 22. But his flesh upon him shall have pain, comma, and his soul within, within him shall mourn. So there's a difference by reading those verses. And you see there about the flesh in him shall have pain. Well, we know in this time period, our flesh has pain. We've all had pain in our flesh. And also his soul within him shall mourn. So we're identifying the two. You, you look in Job 33 and look at verse 18. Job 33, 18. Talk to, I've just given you something to look at here. Job 33, 18. In 33, 18, He keepeth back His soul from the pit, comma, and His life from perishing by the sword. There's a difference there too. Now I've said all that to you to say this. We live in the, in, the, in, in the but now, the dispensation of grace. If you go back in time past, in the Old Testament, of course, we've been there, and Job's telling you, we've read that soul and body is different. But there's also some verses over here that you have to identify, and you know the difference, uh, that it appears that soul and body are joined. Well, the reason for that, you remember this whenever, whenever you, well, for us right now, but before I was saved, 
I look like this. My, my soul and body, my soul was stuck in my flesh. Yours was too. But once we believe the gospel, now my soul's not stuck. But do you understand over there in that Old Testament, they have spirit, soul, and body. They had spirit, soul, and body like we do now. So what's that mean? Their soul is stuck in their body. You think about that. So we're going to read some verses, and I'm just sharing that with you, and I want to give you this. Uh, they're often spoken of as one over there in time past, even though they're not one. We've identified that in Job. And there's no, we're not, there's no contradiction. I'm just telling you, they're, they're considered one because stuck, the soul stuck in their flesh. So I hope that makes it clear. And we'll read a couple of these verses. Turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. The Bible's absolutely true without any error. Uh, we've already identified in the Old Testament that uh, soul and body is, is not one, it's, it's two. But looking at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, Notice it says, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So there's seventy souls. Well, these souls had bodies too. And that, that's what those are seventy people that came out. Well, by saying that, turn to Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 2. See, when, if you read, you can't, you, you understand the difference that there's a soul and a body, they're different. So Leviticus chapter 5, verse 2, uh, or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of an unclean cattle, or the carcass of an unclean creeping thing, so if, if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Notice the soul touch anything unclean. Any unclean thing. Well, we know the body touches it, but the soul's in the body. And you have to understand that when you read these scriptures. The Bible's made to study, and the Bible's right and man's wrong. Well, look at Leviticus 7, 18. And keep in mind when you're reading this, those Old Testament those, Old Testament, those people in the Old Testament, their soul was stuck in their body. They're not like what we are. Or they weren't, weren't like what we are today. So Leviticus chapter 7, verse 18. Leviticus 7, 18. Notice it says, If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of, of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted. Neither shall it be imputed unto him that offers it. It shall be an abomination and the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. Notice the soul eateth. Well, we understand the soul's in that man, but he's got a body, he's got a mouth, and the mouth takes it in. Uh, but again, soul and body, that soul's stuck in the flesh. There's, no, there's nothing, the Bible's right, like I said, and there's a difference between soul and body. Look in Leviticus 22.6. So when you read this, you have to understand this. Leviticus 22.6. In Leviticus 22.6, verse uh, says, The soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until evening. So the soul touches. Well, what touches? The soul's in the body, but again, you're, you're, you're thinking about the soul and body, because the soul's stuck in the body. It's connected. I mean, they're in Adam. They came out, they're born, they're in Adam, and their soul's in their flesh. <clears throat> and so, but in time past there, you think about the soul joining the body. Well, what about us? I mean, what happened at the cross? Well, we know this. The cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, He was long-suffering in time past for those Old Testament saints. And when were their sins were forgiven? Well, they were forgiven on the cross. That's when they were forgiven. Well, you think about us, 
our sins are forgiven and we believe in death, burial, and resurrection and our sins are forgiven and whenever we're forgiven what's the Bible say happens to our soul and body? It's no longer looking like this over there but it's over here it looks like this. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. This will mean a lot to you when you understand this like this. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. In Colossians 2 and 11, in whom, also you're, in whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins. Well, what's putting off the body of sins? What is that? That's the old sin nature. That's that body of the flesh for the circumcision of Christ. So putting off. So whenever I believe the gospel, my soul was stuck with my flesh and, and God uh, circumcised me and cut my soul out of my flesh and now I'm not stuck in my body like they were in time past. Their soul was stuck in their body. See, I just put a little uh, line there. I should have just put them right together, soul and body. They were stuck together. Yours was that way until you got saved. So that, that's the difference and there's nothing wrong with what's being said over there. You understand? It's just like their soul and body was one, but yet they were different. Because they came in, they, were, they were born from Adam. Whenever you're born and uh, you, you, you're born and your soul is stuck in your flesh because, because you're a sinner. And you have to be saved and once you believe the gospel and trust Christ, then lo and behold, the spirit, soul, and body, your soul and body, soul's cut loose from your body, you're free. There's liberty in Christ. So I, I want to do that. I hope that doesn't confuse any of, of you on that. But that's the way we were. I mean, we were the servants of sin. I mean, my soul was stuck in my flesh, and I, I was free from righteousness. And the only thing I wanted to serve was this old flesh and the things of the world as a lost person. And that's what we did. Some of us were, say, human evil. Some of us was human good. But we're still sinners. Lost. On our way to hell. You know, people, people talk about folks that say they do wrong and end up in jail. You know, maybe human evil that way, but look at all of us, human good, we're all still sinners. There's no difference. Not one bit of difference. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. So, going back to Matthew chapter 10, I'd like to read that verse one more time. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, 28. So this is time past, Matthew 10, 28. This is just like you're in the Old Testament as well, which you are. Even though I, we know that we know that it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still law, is what I'm trying to say. So Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which kill the body, comma, but are not able to kill the soul. Now that verse clearly teaches you there's, there's a difference between body and soul. And that's why you ought to keep that in your memory. We need to be familiar with that verse because it does teach you that. There's a difference. And so the program of sin, you think about the program of sin, the state that we were in, wasn't a pretty picture. I mean, I, I look at my flesh, my soul being stuck in my flesh and dead in my trespasses and sins, and I had a, a dead spirit and I could not communicate with the Lord. I was not righteous. I couldn't perform righteousness. I was not able to get righteousness until I believed the gospel. Then now I'm alive. My spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in. I'm alive. And my soul's cut out of my flesh. <clears throat> I'm dead to sin. And I'm alive unto God. Romans 6 means a lot. 
<clears throat> when you see that. And get kind of, you get a grip on that. So the problem of sin, I mean, <clears throat> it ends with death, Romans 6.23. And we know that death is the lake of fire for a lost person. So that's the program of sin. Well, what about the program of righteousness? Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanked. And that's what we, we ought to do, thank God. And we do. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed in the heart, that your inner man, the heart, inner, obeyed in the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So now we're the servants of righteousness. We've got the problem we're in today is the problem of righteousness. We're free to sin, free from sin. We're dead to sin. We're alive unto God. So, but God be thanked. Romans 6, 17. Before salvation, we were all the servants of sin. Every one of us. We were in that program of sin. And that's all we cared about. And that's all we knew uh, until we were saved. You know, Romans 6, 17, I told you that there's a verse, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Uh, there's a verse that you ought to add to that, Romans 8, 34. It says, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. You can turn over there and look at it. Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 34. Romans 8, 34. <clears throat> And Romans, I'm sorry, John 8, 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. John 8, 30, 8 34. Then in Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. You can put those together. You're going back to Romans 6, 17 though, it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Notice it says there that ye've obeyed from the heart. Well, what does that mean? This will, this will mean something to you too. You know, we've all been, a lot of us, I don't say all, but the majority of us here have been in that religious system. And we've heard a lot of different teachings about salvation, even salvation and all. And, you know, the most common thing is that you, about confessing, praying, that calling on the Lord, that type thing. Well, when you read verse Romans 6, 17, it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but, notice that, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You didn't obey from the mouth. You didn't obey by praying. You obeyed from the heart. That's what it is. That heart is your inner man. It's your soul. And that's something that we all know now. So, to, what, to obey from the heart means to believe a message that requires no outward works or activity. When you believe, obey from the heart, it's all internal. Nothing outward. It's not my speaking. It's not my praying. It's believing in the heart, with the heart, obeyed in the heart. That's all it is. And that's how serious it is because I know this now that praying is a work. And you don't pray to be saved. You believe. You, it's like Paul says, you've obeyed in the heart. Well, what did you obey? You obeyed the message. You believe the message that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and that he was raised again. Now that that's what we believe, and we understand that it's an inward heart attitude. And notice it says there, verse seventeen, that form of doctrine. And we've gone over that. That's sound doctrine. I mean, you can't be saved unless it's sound doctrine. I mean, and all of us we understand now it takes sound doctrine to be saved. It takes believing that Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, He died for our sins, was buried and raised again. It takes sound doctrine. We believe that inward in our heart. We obey in the heart that form of doctrine. That's an inward thing. It's not outward. 
we all understand that here today. And you can't be saved any other way. It's got to be sound doctrine. You can't be saved by going to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's, gospel, that's a gospel over there, but it's a gospel of the kingdom. You've got to be saved with the gospel of grace. And, and that is sound doctrine. Well, and notice in verse 18, this leads to something else. Being then made free from sin. Well, we're dead to sin. We're free from sin because verse 7 tells you for he that is dead is freed from sin. So we've been, we're dead from sin, we're freed from sin. Uh, you became the servants of righteousness. And that's what's happened to us whenever we believe the gospel. We became servants of righteousness. And do you know what that means? When God saved us, He bought us and He owns us. That's what we're to serve. It also says servants of righteousness. We're servants. And you'll say, well, how can we be servants? Well, he bought us. He paid the price. He owns me today. And how do we know that? We read it last week. 1 Corinthians 6 makes that clear to us. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. So you think about a servant. We're, we're servants of righteousness. That's a program of righteousness we're in today. We're servants to Him. Because we're up 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Notice that bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to Him. My body belongs to Him. We've been bought with a price. And we're, what happens when you... Well, we're, we're His possession. By reading 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, it makes it clear. We're His possession. And when Paul tells you in Romans 6, 18, that you're servants of righteousness now, well, the servant is, hey, I've got a master. Somebody owns me. And the Lord bought me with a price. And I can say that to you. What happens to you when you belong to someone else? Well, don't you think you're obligated to be obedient to that person? And by saying that, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 6. The responsibility that grace gives us today to obey I mean, yes, we're saved by grace, but grace gives you that responsibility to, to obey. Grace gives us an opportunity to obey. Grace makes us a debtor to obey. And we've got, we have liberty and we have freedom. That's why in Galatians 5, 1, it talks about free. We're, we have liberty in Christ Jesus. But I also understand with that liberty, I've been bought with a price. I, I belong to Him. And... This is going to lead to something else. The, this freedom is liberty to serve Him, motivated by love. Well, whose love is it? People, you hear people all the time saying, "Well, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, and all my soul." You know, people say, I, "I just can't tell you how much I love the Lord." Do you love Him? Let me show you something. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. I've said all that saying that we've been bought with a price. We no longer belong to ourselves. We're the servants of righteousness. We're, we're to serve Him. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Notice in 5, 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, notice that you have people out there teaching that Christ only died for the elect. That verse says that Christ died for all. Then we're all dead. We were all dead in trespasses and sins. And he died for all. But there's something in that verse. It talks about verse 14 there for 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. You know, this verse does not say my love for Christ is what constrains us. It doesn't say that. 
It's not my love. The love of Christ constraineth us. It's His love. You know, under the law, the commandment is love God. That was under the law. I mean, there's verses. Not, there's one there in Luke 10, 27. We won't go to it, but you love God, and He'll bless you. That's, that's under the law. If you don't love Him, He'll curse you. That's under the law, as in time past. But under grace, and that's what we're under today, look how I love you. Talking about the Lord. How much He loves us. Verse 2 Corinthians 5, 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. So, that leads us to this question. You think about the love of Christ constraineth us. Uh, under grace, look how I love you. Talking about Christ loving us. The love of Christ, we're not, it's not our love for Him, but His love for us. Do you see that? It's not, not you saying, I love the Lord and I'm willing to do because I love Him. No, it's the love of Christ that constrains us. And what that love produces, gratitude. I, I'm thankful for what God did for me. The Lord Jesus Christ came on Calvary and God loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. And the gratitude that I have because of what the Word of God teaches is what motivates me today. And you think about gratitude that constrains us. You know, when you constrain us there for the love of Christ constraineth us, it, to constrain is pressing in us. I mean, you think about the pressing and carries us on to obedience. That's what motivates me to want to preach. Whether it's uh, difficult times or easy times, the love of Christ, He loves me. Not that I love Him, I do love Him, but it's not me, it's His love that constrains me. That, His love motivates me. Because we say we love Him and then we, we're just up and down, wishy-washy. But His love's not up and down. I mean, he, and, and because of that, that's what constrains you. And that's what pushes you and motivates you to do. And that, that, that love service, the bondage of serving out of gratitude and love. And you'll, you, you wonder why folks have a hard time being consistent in, in the work of the ministry. Let's put it that way. Because the, the doctrine is not in them and they're not understanding that it's the love of Christ that constrains you. That's the motivation. The motivation for you to be here today is the love of Christ. Not that you love Him, it's He loved you and died for you on the Calvary. And that makes a difference. And that doctrine built up in you is going to motivate you. It's going to push you. And you'll want to obey Him. You'll want to be the servant of righteousness. You know, that's the least I can do is be a servant because of His love for me. I mean, you, you could go on and, and talk about that and motivate by what He's done for us. So when you see folks not motivated, you can, act, you can understand this. The doctrine is not there like it should be. And you'll say, well, you need to make a phone call and get people to come. The phone call is a band-aid. It won't work. You can pray for them. You can, you can talk to them and share the word with them. But you know what? They're going to have to take and open up the word and put that doctrine in, in them to get them motivated and, and let it press up to, on them and push them like it's doing you. Because it won't work any other way. And that, that's something that uh, hopefully we all understand that. So going back to Romans 6, 19, and our time's almost up. Romans 6, 19. That really helps me there in 2 Corinthians 5. And I hope that will help you. Romans chapter 6, verse 19, talks about there, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have guilted your members' service to uncleanness and to iniquity and iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness and to holiness. I mean, live, yield your members, your body, yield your part to your members to service to righteousness. And you know, that's uh, gratitude. 
we can do that because of gratitude. Because he loved us and died for us on Calvary. And that's what uh, constrains us. And so, you think about to be a good servant of righteousness. Why? We realize our position and who God has made us in Christ. We realize that. We understand, hey, I know I'm saved. I'm in Christ now. Hey, and I just want to walk worthy. I want to be obedient. And I'm thankful I can say that I'm a servant of righteousness today because of what He's done for me. That He loved me so much that He died on Calvary. So two programs in the Bible, and, we, and that's why believers ought to understand there's a program of sin and there's a program of righteousness. And as believers, it ought to excite us and be thankful for the love that He has. has he loved us so that He died for us. And our Heavenly Father loves us. And we're in His Son. And He cares for us. He understands the hurt we have. He understands what the circumstances we go through. And He loves us. And He's given us a word to read and study. And just rejoice based on who you are in Christ. 